Yes, my peeps, welcome back to the channel. Well, you know, this is day two, part two. See? Because the uh, defense now, I got rebut what the prosecutor say. See? But all of them are present them, them case. So when all of them don't present them case, the judge them are going to deliberate and thing and they come up with them, with them final decision. But that's going to be like maybe in two months. Two to three months. So we're gonna continue listen. What well, the, the, the defense them have to say right now? Let's listen up. We, we don't require to hear you on the JS2 issue, Mr. Knox. Thank you very much. This is Sunday. This is my lady. Um, can I deal with my own transmissions? Not in the order in which you made them, but, but hopefully by topic, because that may. Uh, assist, I hope. At the heart, obviously, of my learning friend's submissions were, was, was, a, was a submission essentially that the way in which the court should look at this was in two stages, the jury issue. Yeah, the first being, uh, was the judge obliged to discharge one juror? And the second being, uh, uh, was the judge then obliged to uh, discharge others because of the potential impact of that one juror? Our submission is that that approach is flawed, and we make that submission for two reasons, two independent reasons. The first is this. My own friend said, albeit slightly half-heartedly, one might think, uh, when asked the question, that the test, essentially, that should be applied uh, it, it is not the Porter and McGill and the WOW test. It, it, it was uh, one that I think he referred to it ultimately as being possible bias, not appearance of bias. Um, it, in other words, as I understood it, actual bias, not, uh, not apparent bias. In our submission, that was an important submission for him to make. He needed to make that for two reasons. Firstly, because he accepts that ultimately this jury, jury included, to use his language, a bent juror. In terms of the fair-minded bystander, that immediately must raise eyebrows. But secondly, probably more importantly in one sense, his submissions this morning focused on what he, uh, uh, whether or not the judge was acting reasonably. Um, that in our submission is not ultimately the, the, the key question. The key question is whether or not the fair-minded bystander would effectively conclude there is a real risk of bias. Now, the fair-minded bystander test has been consistently, I'll just give you the references to it, applied by criminal courts. It was applied in Brown, as you saw when I, when I opened, which is at page 6330, paragraph 38. It was also applied uh, applying Brown in Morrison, which my learned friend took you to, page 7564, paragraph 36. And there's good reason for it to apply. There's no suggestion anywhere that in, in any case that there's a different test. But the good reason for it, it links in with the submissions I made um, yesterday about Nawal. You remember in Nawal, which is 6318, the court emphasized essentially that the reason for the fair-minded bystander test was the need to ensure that there was comfort, confidence in, in the justice system in a democratic society. The language is, if I, if I remember right, is public perception is key. And that need for public perception it, it must apply equally as powerfully in crime, if not more powerfully, where liberty is an issue, confidence in the jury system is important. That was part of Lord Bingham's, Lord Justice Bingham's, as he was then, remarks in Putnam. Uh, 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 and so public confidence remains as important. And it should be noted, uh, again, I won't take you to it at a given time, but in Gregory in the United Kingdom, um, consistent with what I've just said, a criminal case, 7930, the court, European Court of Human Rights started by uh, directing themselves that uh, courts must inspire confidence, same principle as the well, paragraph 43, and refer to the need for the need for the impartiality subjectively as well as objectively. In other words, um, it must appear 
uh, a, a criminal court must appear unbiased. And there is nothing in our submission that supports a departure from a court of appeal. One thing I should say, just because there was some suggestion about what was argued in the court of appeal, uh, paragraph 240 of the court of appeal's judgment expressly refers to an argument that Porter and McGill applied, that it was said that the judge had applied the wrong test, and that's electronic bundle 5870. That is preceded, just in terms of what's argued, at reference page, page 5867 to 68, uh, paragraph two, uh, 234, by reference to the fact there was an argument about overcompensation. The overcompensation clearly was before the court of appeal. What was the paragraph reference for that? Two through four. Two through four, thank you. Second point, whether or not I'm right about the first point. In our submission, the prosecution's approach is essentially of saying you can have a jury with one biased member and it's still a lawful jury is inconsistent with the uh, uh, statutory scheme. And there's a couple of features that I'll just remind you of. Firstly, uh, if you go to, uh, and these are uh, uh, 6803, or, or the, the new version of the Jury Act of, it is, is in the same terms, essentially, for these purposes, 313, you will remember, is the provision that talks about uh, how uh, a, a jury is properly constituted if it's not reduced by more than one. But if you are discounting someone, essentially, on the basis that they no longer should properly be a member of the jury because they are uh, bent, again, to use that language. In those circumstances, the jury ceases, we would submit, to be properly constituted. Now, one particular reason for that is that if, if you look at 31.4, it might, be, it might be helpful for us to have this in front of us in the correct version, which uh, was sent by email to us earlier this morning. Um, I'm sorry, I've got it, I've certainly, I've, that's why I've got the iPad yeah. up, so I've got the correct version. So yeah. I, I, I don't think the language changes for these purposes, but I absolutely accept the point that it is better to have the source. Um, what time is it, sir? Pagination, it's page 18. Yes. I think four of us have the. Sorry. My email is disconnected. I'm sorry. It's <laughs> on SharePoint as well. No, this version came in. Thank you. Um, 31.3 is the provision essentially that talks about a properly constituted jury and makes it clear that if the numbers are not reduced by more than one, um, that the jury remains properly constituted. Well, we would submit that if someone is biased and essentially being discounted by the judge as, as on the basis that essentially the, the, the verdict can be de 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 delivered by 10, that is inconsi inconsistent with 31.3. But 31.4, even more importantly, in one sense, deals with how what, what a verdict of 11 jurors, how 11, a verdict of 11 jurors is treated. It, it, it provides that it will be unanimous, essentially, deemed as unanimous, even though one person has been discharged demonstrating really that the expectation of the legislation 
is that all jurors will participate. And that's even clearer, we would submit. If you go down in the version that we've got to, it's page 24 within the pagination of the document, section 44.1a, which is the provision that allowed a majority verdict. And of course, that provides, as, you, as the court's well aware, and as is common, that you can't immediately go to a jury verdict. And that's important, because what it's demonstrating is that the starting point should be that all jurors participate in the verdict, and all jur ver jurors should, as far as possible, be in agreement about the verdict, if that's not possible, then you can go to a majority verdict. But it's, it, the, the view is that everyone should participate. All of that explains in our submission why, and none of this is sort of unusual, or that's, uh, it's reflected broadly in some of the provisions or similar, similar approaches in, in England and Wales. All of that explains why in Putnam, you will remember, and it's page 7579. Sorry, Sorry. <laughs> Do you have a doubt of whether it was a murder case or murder in the same section? Well, he's kept it going. It, it, no, it, 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 it wasn't, and that's why section. Sorry, when I used 44. 1A, I meant capital A, not little a, um, because that's why the majority verdict could be re could be reached, as obviously it eventually was. But as I say, the key point we make about that is that that demonstrates the idea that the jury should, as far as possible, be coming to a collective decision. And that all explains, you remember, if you go back to Lord Bingham at seven, uh, Lord Justice Bingham, as he then was, at 7579, the passage towards the bottom of the page that I took you to yesterday, Lord Bingham bases his approach in circumstances where material they had essentially, it was one juror who was, who was approached, um, uh, he bases his approach on the need for collective integrity, collective and individual integrity. He's not He's making it clear, and we would submit this is consistent with the statutory scheme. This isn't the jury system; isn't a system where you can say, "Well, you've got eleven individual actors." Uh, he's saying you've got eleven people who have individual responsibilities, but they also act as a collective, and that's what the legislation is plainly intended to represent. And that is reflected, I won't take you back to it, in the Bay Chandon decision that we, did, we produced yesterday from the Guyana Court of Appeal. It explains why a, a trial without its full numbers can't be re regarded as a valid a trial, even though, in, in principle, it might have been possible to proceed with the, the, the number that was active, who were actually involved in the verdict. And it, fundamentally, there is a good reason for that, and, and it's that this. Everyone remembers, and most lawyers remember very strongly, 12 angry men. And it's the, the point about that is, is you can have one member of the jury, jury who is completely out of line with everybody else, who persuades everybody. And your, your right is to have that one person come forward. And what ha the real risk, one of the real risks in these circumstances is that the corrupt juror well, any friend, because he needs this, has to accept that the corrupt juror can participate, potentially important he participates, because he might be the minority, it, 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 the, 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 the person who is going to try and persuade everybody else that he's right on the evidence. But of course, there is a, then a, a problem, because all the other jurors, if they're aware of this, may well, understandably, want to discount his views, perfectly properly in one sense, you would think. But that's the, that's the fundamental problem that you've got in this case. And that's one of the reasons why you can't separate this, because uh, you, you, you can't separate the questions in the way that my only friend does, because he needs to say, because he needs the corrupt juror to remain on the, 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 on the jury, that corrupt juror uh, needs to be able to participate in principle in the, in, in the decision making, but it's very difficult to see how they can do that without then 
that there being a problem. And rem all of that statutory scheme obviously needs to be viewed in light of the fact that there is a right under the Charter, uh, Section 16, to an independent and impartial tribunal. And the loan friend took you to uh, 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 the structure of the um, Jury Act. He made a number of points. His basic point was essentially that, that, that um, although if you had an incapable uh, a juror, for example, someone suffering from mental disorder, uh, 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 they would have to be discharged. In some sense, a, a biased juror was different. But the fundamental problem is with that submission that the biased juror, of course, is incapable of complying with the, the, their oath by definition. If they are biased, the oath, it, it, the, in, in this sort of situation, in any event, the corrupt juror has already said that they're not going to comply with their oath. Why are they any different to others who are effectively discharged because they're unable to comply with their oath? Now, my dear friend, in the submissions essentially said, argued that one of the reasons why the judge wasn't obliged to discharge the briber was that they apparently favored the defendant and he emphasized the fact that um the forewoman had given evidence or had uh, given an account that nobody was listening to the person offering bribes i think the reference is electronic bundle 517221 but that demonstrates in one sense the problem because it demonstrates how once you've got this situation you're not adopting the jury wasn't adopting the putnam approach it wasn't taking collective responsibility essentially it was saying you need to be isolated in terms of the impact on the jury what my only friend failed to address in my submission is how the judge was actually in a realistic attempt at a position to address to, and understand the impact on the jury. He had no evidence about how long the jurors had been aware of this. The Putnam point that the longer you're aware of it, the more embedded prejudice can become. Uh, he had no explanation as to why the jurors hadn't drawn attention to it. Uh, the jurors were not asked individually if they could put the bribe to one side. And so on the face of it, he had very little information about impact. Uh, um, uh, and that meant it was very difficult we submit for him to assess. Now his uh, sort of fundamental point about considering the impact is uh, that what the judge was entitled to take account of, or what the judge, what, 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 what justifies the approach of the judge, was that um, discharging the whole jury would have brought the system into dis, dis, disrepute. It, it would fundamentally undermine the jury system. Firstly, there's no indication these circumstances are common, but if there is a problem along those lines, the answer is for the legislature to introduce legislation such as England. If, 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 this, if, if the system become uh, 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 undermined essentially, there are solutions. The solution isn't to allow a trial to continue in circumstances where there is a, 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 a lack of independence. That was the context though, of my learning friend's submissions, which fundamentally were that the judge's discretion was exercised correctly in not discharging the jury. I take it there's no evidence uh, about uh, jury tampering in Jamaica that's before us? No. Thank you. Not that, certainly not that I'm aware of. Um, the my learning friend's next submission, based on what I just said, was that the judge exercised his discretion correctly. It was an exercise in his discretion. Firstly, given what I've already said about the um, uh, uh, Porter McGill test, the Lowell test, in our submission, that's the wrong question. The, the, the real question here is, was the constitutional uh, right to an independent tri uh, trial by an independent court uh, breached? 
that's important because the suggestion was essentially all that uh, the judge had was a mere allegation. Firstly, we of course know that there was in fact a conviction, but secondly, in any event, the issue is real risk. Well, then friend said the judge was entitled to rely on uh, the foreman's uh, role, and in particular the fact that she uh, said that none of the other ju jurors had um, uh, taken a bribe and that they would follow their oath. Part of the problem with that, the primary problem with that, of course, is where you have um, unconscious bias, by definition, it is a, a problem the individual may find difficult to discount whatever their, uh, um, uh, whatever their, 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 their sort of professed uh, um, approach will be to decision making. That's why, if you think about Putnam in my submission, Lord, uh, Lord Justice Bingham made it clear there comes a point where you have to discharge the jury um, if, if, for example, the poison has been allowed to spread for too long. The second point is, of course, that was all information obtained through the form, and, and that is a problem because of the, the lack of any public record of what the jurors themselves said, and I'll come, potentially come back to that. The third point that only friend made was the Court of Appeal upheld the conviction. Unsurprisingly, we would say that the approach of the Court of Appeal, particularly paragraph 238, and I won't take you to it, everyone's familiar with it, obviously de uh, demonstrated a flawed approach. Some further points that Penelope Friend made to justify essentially the outcome in this case. The first was that the bribe was offered by someone who was seeking to favour the defendant. In submissions, unlike in writing, it appeared to be accepted that there's no evidence that any of the defendants was to blame for the um, bribe. That's important because it means none of them have taken actions which could in any sense be said to be effectively a waiver of their rights. But more importantly, Putnam is clear authority in its 7579 that there is a risk of prejudice against, and that's obvious. People do overcompensate. My only friend said, you can tell that the jury is independent because it acquitted Mr. Williams already made the point effectively that we would submit that the jury simply couldn't deliver a, a, a lawfully deliver a verdict. But in any event, bias doesn't necessarily mean that someone will, will always uh, favour, or will always rather deliver a verdict that, that, that is the verdict sought by the party they favour. Bias means, essentially, you're more likely to favour one party than the other. The fact that the evidence, well, the fact that the, it, it, the, put it this way, you can have a case where a, a, biased, you're a, a biased individual um, uh, acts against their biases because the evidence is so overwhelming. That doesn't mean they weren't biased. It doesn't mean that there isn't a higher threshold to overcome um, uh, if the bias is against you. Bias simply means you favour one party o over the other. And it, it, uh, I mean, that's in our submission fundamental. And that's why the acquittal of Mr. Williams in circumstances where the evidence against Mr. Williams appears to have been particularly weak, um, dependent on Mr. Chow alone, doesn't necessarily mean that there wasn't, uh, um, uh, that the jury didn't favour um, the prosecution in light of what had happened, unconsciously favoured the prosecution. Now, my new friend, in terms of uh, jury independence and the relevance of Mr. Williams' acquittal, initially cited Gregory. Gregory, in fact, was the one where uh, it was the case where the European Court found no violation of uh, Article 6 in light of directions. Gregory, though, was followed by Sander, um, which my learning friend, I think, this morning accepted was the case where one person had been acquitted. The approach of the majority of the European Court was to find, and you see this, I think it's 7956 paragraph 30, was to find a violation of Article 6 because a racist juror 
can't be expected to change their night, their views in, relate, in response to a direction. <coughs> now that is, we would submit, consistent with Putnam. Putnam recognising that there comes a point, essentially, at which prejudicial views become so embedded that you can't change your mind. My well, learned friend pointed to the dissenting judgment in Sander, but that's a dissenting judgment. It, 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 it's, it, it, the majority approach in our submission is the correct one, as I say, reflecting Putnam, and that demonstrates the, the real problem in relation to the second aspect of my learned friend's case, which is the impact on the other jurors, which is the judge simply didn't have the information to know whether or not this was a poison that could realistically be discounted on the basis of the direction. Well, any friend also said you can discount unconscious bias because of the strength of the evidence. The, ju the jurors will essentially have said um, that, 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 that they didn't need to consider the corruption because the, the, the case was so strong. Problem, the fundamental problem we would submit with that, uh, ignoring some practical problems I'll come to in a moment, is that what that is doing is inviting the court to speculate about the jury's thinking. It doesn't know what the, how the jury approached the decision making. Uh, by definition, the jurors may not know in, uh, when, uh, uh, what, what factors, or every factor that influence them. We are potentially talking here about unconscious bias, and that is obviously something that the jury won't necessarily be aware of. And it's particularly difficult for the court to uh, understand effectively the, the impact of bias when it simply didn't sit through this long trial. And then Fred has summarized the evidence but just pick out a couple of points out of that, the, the sort of fundamental point that, that, that's at the heart of this. He started by referring to Mr. Chow's evidence, but Mr. Chow's evidence was clearly rejected in part by the jury because Mr. Williams was acquitted. He then relied on um, uh, 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 the electronic exhibits, but there, as he accepts fairly, there were arguments about the in, uh, integrity of those exhibits. That's a credibility issue. He finally says uh, you know, that the heart of the um, defence case was that various exhibits had been fabricated. That is a credibility issue. That's an issue that requires assessment of um, what the officers and others said in cross-examination. And that's it's very, we would submit it's impossible to, for, 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 for this court, um, many years after the event, with transcripts, but um, not much else essentially, to assess the extent to which the jury would inevitably have um, uh, discounted, because of the strength of the evidence, a prejudicial material. In any event, fundamentally, that explains why there is a right to trial by an independent jury, because it's for the jury to assess facts. What one of the new friends' submissions do is potentially undermine that right. And that explains why all the authorities demonstrate essentially that the proviso doesn't apply. What my learning friend was seeking to do in my submission was apply, seeking to apply the proviso, um, having accepted later in his submissions that the proviso can't apply to an unfair trial. But if it's a biased jury, it's an un you have an unfair trial. And that's entirely consistent with Seraphim as well, because it's it, it, it clearly, if the jury was unlawful, because it was biased from, it didn't comply with the Jury Act, um, Seraphim paragraph 49 in, in our submission makes it clear the verdict can't be upheld. In terms of directions, Bonnet Taylor, in our submission reflects the approach in Smith that directions must be apposite, clear, and emphatic. The reference to Smith I gave in opening, it's 7671 paragraph 24. The direction in, in Bonnet Taylor that was upheld at 629024 was a specific direction. Sorry, 629. 6290 paragraph 24. <coughs> And that's the context of what followed, which was the assumption the jury would follow the direction. It's important to note, however, that 
paragraph 25, the statement that there is an assumption that the jury uh, will follow a direction, was then followed by paragraph 26, which started with the word however, making it clear there was a degree of qualification, that emphasized the importance of the protocol, the need to investigate, because you can't, <laughs> You can't, in one sense, rely on a direction until you're satisfied that the matter is capable of being cured. Here, the problem with the directions were, firstly, they were to a juror who'd already demonstrated they would not comply with the oath. Secondly, those directions were given in the context of what was, by our calculations, a five-day summing up, um, where there had been repeated uh, uh, references to the need to comply with the oath. Um, and that, in one sense, means this just looked like a repeat of those uh, uh, um, uh, 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 directions. And those directions had been given in the circumstances where it would have been clear to the jury that the judge was concerned that they might be influenced by the fame of at least one of the defendants. And so the, 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 the focus of those directions was be cautious, you'll read a lot about this trial, essentially, you'll be, uh, 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 and, and what the, um, uh, uh, and so it was essentially another direction, didn't expressly reference fame, but it was in the context of a situation where the judge had clearly, was clearly expressing concerns about the impact of fame. In any event, as I say, we would say, you can't give a direction that, that, that in circumstances where um, there is a risk of unconscious bias. It, 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 it's very difficult to, 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 to direct the jury in a way that will overcome that, if it's sufficiently embedded, at least. Why, why, why are we assuming it's unconscious bias? If, if every member of the jury has been approached and offered a bribe to acquit the defendants, one would think it was a quite conscious bias. Well, the jury would think, but, but the law does not think, that that will be a relevant matter going to their guilt or innocence. But of course their job is to decide in accordance with the evidence. It isn't the real problem here, that it will be a temptation hard to resist to decide or to be influenced in the decision of the case by something other than the evidence presented to the court. Well, to be clear, I, I'm not saying it wasn't it wasn't conscious bias. What I'm dealing with, one of the reasons, what I'm dealing with is, um, in one sense, my learned friend's submission, which is to say, you can trust the jury to comply with a direction that um, they should, I mean, there is a problem with how detailed the direction was, but let's assume that the direction was sufficiently de detailed. The, you can trust the jury to comply with the direction that they, will com that they should disregard this factor. And there's no reason in practice why it couldn't say, well, because the jury will all meant to be aware of the bribe. I'm aware that some of you have been approached about a bribe, you should, now, the prosecution submission is you can trust the jury to comply with that. Whether that's realistic as a matter of human nature may be open to question. But assuming that's right, you still have the problem that even if a juror says to themselves, I understand that this looks pretty bad, that, the, that there was a, a bribe offered to us, but I understand what the judge has said. I need to put that out of my mind. It is very difficult, and this is why I focused on the unconscious bias aspect, it's very difficult as, as a matter of human nature to actually stop yourself unconsciously being influenced by that because that's the way unconscious bias but it works it, 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 it's it, and that's that's why is because I, I'm in one sense focusing on a particular difficulty that in my in our submission simply can't be addressed by a direction but I accept that in reality it, 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 conscious bias is a very real problem here okay. Yes, can I, I'm, I'm uh, in terms of the, just a couple of, a couple of final quick features. Firstly, the um, procedure adopted. All we would invite the court to look at is, because my learned friend relies on it very heavily, Braithwaite 7358, the importance, in particular the citation of Para 52 of an earlier case called Ball, the importance of matters being properly recorded in open court, 
which is the problem with the, 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 the communicate use of the poor woman, for example, that is important because it, 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 it allows essentially assurance uh, that there's been compliance with um, the correct approach. There was a recording, it was transcribed. But there, there was that, but not of the poor woman, the poor woman's communications with the jury. And, yes. and so in Braithwaite, there was a, there was a, a, a lot of material that had been transcribed, but the problem was that there was a a, 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 a sort of private communication between judge and and and, um, and jury that hadn't that there, was, there was material that hadn't adequately been recorded. Um, in terms of retirement, very quickly, the bench book is clearly in consolidating. The fact of the court, the, the approach of the Court of Appeal demonstrates they clearly believe that the judge wanted to and was entitled to to try to, to try and get a verdict quickly, essentially, because of the problems that have arisen. That is a reflection we would submit of pressure being put on the jury. Finally, in terms of, I, I think a retrial proviso I've probably already addressed, at, given the learning trend submissions, in our submission it's pretty clear the proviso can't apply. Um, retrial. One thing I'd wish to highlight about that, the learning trend submissions yesterday about why the judge was in, entitled to adopt the approach he did, correctly and fairly pointed to the, the potential difficulties of the retrial in light of matters such as profile. Well, those difficulties are not d diminished, they've become greater because of passage of time. It, it, this, this is something that's now high profile. In our submission, that submission supports our argument that there's no point permitting this for it because a fair trial is now very difficult, impossible, you submit. Thank you. I think that covers it. I just want to That's right. Thank you. Well, my peeps, you see what I go on. The defense had a month. It's a cartel for free. They want a retrial. They want to win the retrial thing. Because so much things happen over the years and evidence and things get missed up on things. So it wouldn't work out with them. Them other man a cartel for free. See? So they want put all of them things, I present all of them things on the table right now to the judge. But they have a break right now, so we'll take a break too. So we'll come back with part three. See? So you don't know who the panel is like Matt Lackina. You know? One yard man, second chance. See? So go and subscribe to the channel and you know? big up my subscribers you now. Keep on subscribing. Tell a friend, tell a friend. We out.